In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. O Lord, who enlightens the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever enjoy his consolation. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians. And St. Thomas More. Pray us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great. Well, thank you everyone for coming to today's talk. This is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart because, uh, well, as you'll come to see, it has many applications. And I, uh, it's on leadership, and particularly the leadership philosophy of General Colin Powell. Just a little bit of explanation of who he was. Uh, and you see, retired chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States military. So he uh, was reached the decoration or the rank of four-star general, so you don't get to that level without uh, you know, some real uh, expertise and demonstrated expertise again and again and again. But also uh, during, I think, the, the, when you retire Chiefs of Staff or Chief of Staff, I, you might even reach, I think, five-star, or maybe in the time of war. But the thing that struck me, and I came across this PowerPoint about 20 years ago when I first started really getting interested in the whole question of leadership. I was thrust in a position of leadership that I hadn't expected and I felt very inadequately prepared for. And uh, I, you know, I'd been ordained for about three and a half years and you might think, well, how could you be thrust or prepared for ordination without being prepared for leadership? I was prepared in many ways but not in, in a very clear and explicit way as uh, it outlines in this uh, PowerPoint presentation. It was actually put together, the first time version of this talk that I heard was a 10-point talk by John Maxwell, John C. Maxwell. If any of you want to read some great, great literature on leadership, then I really encourage you to read anything by John C. Maxwell. He used to be a pastor of one of these mega churches in San Diego, two or three thousand people coming every weekend, uh, if not more, and anyway, eventually he left that ministry and began two companies, which he called Enjoy Ministries, and the idea of these companies were to accumulate uh, leadership wisdom and to facilitate leaders to actually grow in the ability of leadership and to spread this so that they'll be more effective because leadership uh, is sometimes effective and oftentimes in practice is ineffective. And as a result of that, then it determines the effectiveness of your mission. So many people have a great mission, really worthwhile cause, but because they're not properly trained in leadership, then as a result, they don't succeed in their goal. So it actually has multiple, multiple applications. The Anyway, and I'll comment more and more on leadership philosophy as we go along. The Colin Powell himself, as I said, was a military man. He, uh, I don't know much about his background, if he had any before he entered into the United States military. He eventually served as the Secretary of State under George W. Bush, the second Bush, and, he, and then eventually, after a few years, he resigned from that. But what I love about Colin Powell is, although he's, he's a believer, he's not a, a Catholic believer, and he'll differ in his views than from us in some ways, but his leadership wisdom is indeed pure leadership wisdom. And you'll see again and again as we go through the various points and the explanation, what distinguishes a real leader from what distinguishes a would-be leader or a manager. A lot of his examples are, in fact, uh, military-based, just, just because you know where his background is. But then again, you'll see that his wisdom can be applied to politics, to the government, to a university. It can be applied to church side of things. So it's amazing. Feel free to ask uh, questions along the way because each point will be, they'll be, we'll try to cover about nine points in this talk and then we'll continue the next nine points uh, next week. So uh, 
If uh, the first lesson will go through, thank you, I've got my mysterious operator of the PowerPoint presentation working away on the side. So let's read it together. I'm not sure if you can see this on the camera. It's a print's a bit small. So lesson one is, being responsible sometimes means pissing people off. Now, a little uh, caution here. Pissing people off in the United States is not as strong as it sounds in Australia, okay? It just means annoying them, it means uh, disturbing them, making them uncomfortable, but it's not an, an insulting word. He goes on to say, good leadership involves responsibility to the welfare of the group, which means that some people will get angry at your actions and decisions. It's inevitable if you're honorable. Trying to get everyone to like you is a sign of mediocrity. You'll avoid the tough decisions. You'll avoid confronting the people who need to be confronted. And you'll avoid offering differential rewards based on differential performance because some people might get upset. Ironically, by procrastinating on the difficult choices, by trying not to get anyone mad, and by treating everyone equally nicely, regardless of their contributions, you'll simply ensure that the only people you'll wind up angering are the most creative and productive people in the organization. That is jam-packed with leadership wisdom. If you're a responsible leader, you're going to upset people. What's rule number one of most leaders that you come across? And I mean 95, 98% of leaders keep everybody happy. I don't know. That's at least been my experience. My experience has been mostly in church circles, but it's basically keep people happy. Don't upset anybody. You know, they might walk away. What Colin Powell is saying is, stiff cheddar, let them walk away if you're upsetting them for the right reasons. But if in your mind as a leader you have, I mustn't, I cannot upset anybody, what you've effectively done is you've cut off your own legs from underneath you. It just means that you have put your potential as a leader from up here to down here somewhere. Because it means that by operating from the principle of not offending anybody, that you'll always aim at where most people are, which is the majority. And he mentions that, I believe. Yeah. And you, you'll, uh, you'll be aiming at the majority. But where is the majority? The majority are average. The majority are not leaders in your community. That's not where the majority is. We have and we live in a society and a culture of mediocrity in so many ways. And occasionally someone stands out. And in Australia we have this terrible thing that we call the tall poppy syndrome. Where if somebody starts to stand out, whether in the field of politics, academia, church life, whatever it happens to be, any secular organization, a sporting organization, we will have to cut them down because jealousies enter in. Instead of saying, bravo, you've done really well, good on you, you've worked hard, excellent. I hope others can reach where you have. Colin Powell is saying, if you want to be great as a leader, a real leader, then you must be prepared to upset people. But he isn't saying, go out of your way to upset people. This is a fine line. You also have leaders, and many of these exist, unfortunately, where you've got a leader who just, it's his way or the highway. This is not what Colin Powell is saying. He's saying, we do need to be discreet. We do need to plan, but eventually, a scenario begins to emerge and there is a consensus about where we really need to go the wise ones in the community begin to let you know and wisdom by the way isn't found in the many it's found in the few not everyone is blessed with the gift of wisdom this is why not everyone is cut out to lead 
So when you then might be thinking, well, in a democracy, it's the majority who has the say. True? That was a question. Okay, great. The majority has the say. So, but the majority, if we've just said, if what I've just said is true, that the majority are not actually wise. Are not actually filled with wisdom because only the wise should be leading. You've got people who are speaking who are wise on the one hand and lots of others who are speaking who are not wise. They're making their opinions known through all sorts of things. Maybe fear, maybe tardiness, maybe I don't, just don't like any change, whatever it is. But they're not speaking from wisdom. So therefore, if a hundred people speak a hundred different opinions, it shouldn't be, those hundred different opinions should not all be given equal weight. And not all opinions are worthy to be heard. And I know this is politically incorrect, but politics and leadership do not go in the same baskets. It's rare to find a true leader as a politician, because sadly the very process itself often weeds them out and does not allow them to reach that potential because precisely they're trying to do what is right for the organization. A true politician doesn't just work for his or her party, we've just had a federal election, but rather works for the true good of the country that they're governing, or whatever level that they're governing. And at no point do they think, well, everything the other party says is wrong. Nobody's ever always wrong, nobody's ever always right. And that's why a true politician is aiming at the general good, but he or she believes that working through the platform of their party happens to be the best way to serve their country, and the democratic process has rewarded them with that authority. But if they're truly wise, they will also aim to learn from the wisdom of the other party, even or other parties, even if it means sometimes that they will be criticized or ridiculed for not having an original policy necessarily, but for agreeing with that of an opponent. What else? Uh, oh, the reward system. Notice Colin Powell also thinks that we shouldn't just reward people all equally nicely, you know? I give uh, someone a, I give a child a lolly because they've done well. Oh, well, I've got to give everybody in the class a lolly because they'll get jealous. Let them get jealous. If they want to get the reward of a lolly or whatever it is, then I should, or, well, I let them know, you need to lift your game. You need to do this, you need to do that. And this was the way it existed in many, many, for many, many years. But with the dawn of political correctness now, saying those common sense things, you know, that you don't reward everyone equally nicely, and then if you don't, then you'll upset somebody, is actually uh, an insult, that's the political correctness. By actually giving in to this, what we've done is we've lowered the standard of leadership. And we've created bureaucracies and bureaucracies, and he'll actually have a point about this later on. So, reward people. A true leader also rewards people according to their merit. Those who merit more, deserve more. Those who merit less, deserve less. And that's how it should be. But then, also, avoiding making the tough decisions. The tough call will be hard. That's why it's called a tough call. But, once you know what needs to happen, that's when we need to pray for courage, seek the proper advice, but then go with it. And Colin Powell later on will have a principle about how to make decisions. So let's keep moving, just so at least we can get through several of these principles. But I hate rushing them because they're so jam-packed with real wisdom. And I've tried these principles in parish life now for 20 years in different organizations where I've worked. And believe me, they are real. So can we have lesson two now? So listen to this. You probably can't see it on the camera, but so I'll read it out. The day, so quote, the, the day soldiers stop bringing you their problems is the day you have stopped leading them. They have either lost confidence that you can help them or concluded 
that you do not care. Either case is a failure of leadership. Wow. In other words, what Colin Powell is saying is, when your subordinates, members of your committee, counsellors, whatever it is, at whatever level, are coming to you with their problems, particularly their own personal problems, that's not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of confidence. But the B-grade leader will interpret that as a sign of weakness, and then he will use it against them when the going gets tough. And he will criticize them and perhaps use it as grounds for non-further promotion. Let's see the explanation beneath. If this were a litmus test, the majority of CEOs would fail. Wow. And some CEOs still manage to make a decent profit for their companies, but often make a greater profit for their own personal pockets, right? Now, one, they build so many barriers to upward communication that the very idea of someone lower in the hierarchy looking up to the leader for help is ludicrous. Isn't it amazing? I mean, how many would go to a department head for help on a personal issue? Or to someone, the chancellor or the vice chancellor? Oh, well, they're too far removed, you know? Obviously, they can't cope with all the different issues of staff members or schools. Yeah. And so there's different levels. I grant that. But it's interesting. We should be able to, if the leader exudes confidence in those that he or she is leading. So number one, they build up barriers. Two, the corporate culture they foster often defines asking for help as weakness or failure. So people cover up their gaps and the organization suffers accordingly. Real leaders make themselves accessible and available. They show concern for the efforts and challenges faced by underlings, even as they demand high standards. Accordingly, they are more likely to create an environment where problem analysis replaces blame. That is amazing. It really is, because then when somebody does need help, they're not going to be afraid to come and ask for it. But, and if there's a genuine problem there, then they'll confide it to you. Because they'll say, look, this and this is going on at home, I can't get to work at these hours, whatever. But I really love my work, I'm struggling, I'm doing my best. Okay, let me help you. But I'm still going to demand things off you, you've got to make up your time some other way. But if, on the other hand, I just ignore that, or I don't allow them, the moment I raise the issue, they're going to think of a million reasons to cover it. So Colin Powell is saying that the good leader gives off a vibe that tells people, welcome. There's a big welcome sign over the door, even if it's not actually there. Whereas many CEOs have this private keep out. I've got this nice office, and you want my job, you want my office, so you're not really coming in here, that kind of message. Whereas a real leader is secure in that and welcomes the underlings to come to tell the problems, whatever they are, and they solve them together. So mercy replaces retribution, that kind of thing. So it's mercy in leadership. And, I mean, very often we see that it's, it's a blame culture, you know? Who failed? Whose responsibility is it that this went wrong? Who should have taken care of it? Okay, you know what? That may have some merit. But usually it's just focusing on where am I going to channel my anger, my frustration? I don't, want to I don't want to be on the receiving end. What Colin Powell is saying is the mess is there. Let's develop a culture who can be the quickest to solve the problem. And that is a very, it leads to a lot of optimism and goodness of heart, uh, while, of course, still having the high standards. So it doesn't mean we just brush under the carpet the things that are done wrong, but it means we, that can't be the end point. The end point has to be the problem solving, not problem, not blaming. Lesson three. How are we going for time? Oh, 
Okay, well, I've got to speed up here. But anyway, I think it's maybe even we, have to, we continue after uh, next semester. So lesson three, do not be befooled, <laughs> I love that word, befooled, uh, by experts and elites. Experts often possess more data than judgment. Elites can become so inbred that they produce hemophiliacs who bleed to death as soon as they are nicked by the real world. Unquote. Just remember that bit there. Experts often possess more data than judgment. Data, information, is not what makes the leader. Good judgment is what makes the leader. And good judgment comes gradually over time from making mistakes and the gift of wisdom. I think it was Lord Acton who once said, knowledge is power, and we use this phrase in common speech, but knowledge is power in a certain way, but it doesn't mean because you get ahead of the game, so to speak, you know things before everyone else, you know where things are heading. But the leader is the one who knows how to use that knowledge properly. And that requires good judgment. Small companies and startups don't have the time for analy analytically detached experts. They don't have the money to subsidize lofty elites either. The president answers the phone and drives the truck when necessary. Everyone on the payroll visibly produces and contributes to bottom line results or their history. It's very easy to see who's working and who isn't in a small office. In a big corporation, the dead wood can hide. But as companies get bigger, they often forget who, quote, brought them to the dance, unquote. Things like all hands involvement, egalitarianism, informality, market intimacy, Daring, risk, speed, agility. Policies that emanate from ivory towers often have an adverse impact on the people out in the field who are fighting the wars or bringing in the revenues. Real leaders are vigilant and combative in the face of these trends. Why? Because they understand why they exist. A leader is there to lead. A leader is there to point the direction because hopefully they have some wisdom and hopefully they can see the direction that the organization needs to go in before everyone else. If I as a leader can't see the direction before everyone else, not necessarily that I'm the first in my community to see where we need to head, but I'm one of the first, then I shouldn't be the leader. I shouldn't be the leader. And when we see leaders who are actually just seeing things when everyone else is seeing them, or later than when everyone else is seeing them, and they're still there, they just stilt the whole organization. Also notice how, I mean, the point I made earlier, that the smaller organization is very easy to keep tab off who is working and who isn't. The moment things become very big, it's actually very difficult to keep tabs. So the leaders who are subsidiary to the higher leaders need to be taught how to create that same culture. And that's why this is a talk on leadership, not only at the very highest level, but indeed at all levels of leadership. Also bear in mind, you know, that the, the, the analytically detached experts, these experts who come into an organization offer their expertise as consult, uh, con consultants and they you know, charge high fees and they may sometimes get it right, other times it's just very draconian. There's one company, how, how many minutes we got left? Okay, we're on time now. Yep, I'll say this and then we'll stop for, for questions. The, um, there was a company uh, overseas and I, I don't recall the name now, but they were all, it was losing money, and they didn't know what was going to happen, but you know, the, the most natural thing is to start cutting on staff, so you start cutting costs. But there's different ways in which you can cut costs, 
and, and different ways in which you can solve the problems of a, of a company in such a situation. And this company thought they all got together, all the workers, and thought, okay, what are we going to do? They all, I think, took a pay cut. I'm not sure how much it was, from the least to the president of the, of the whole group, the, the, of the board. And they were told, look, we're going to have to work very, very hard to get our act together so we can stay afloat. Well, nobody lost their job. Nobody. They all had families to look after. They all had mouths to feed. They came together. So they did. And they started making so much money that then they, the company had to start paying them all these extra bonuses for all these profits that they were making. So not only did they not lose their jobs, they went back to their full payment, but they also then got the extra bonuses. Why? Because the leaders knew that they are there for the good of the company. It was always the overall good. And a good leader knows that he or she will reward those who are bringing in the beans, not those who are counting them. In other words, a central office or head, wherever they are of an organization, exists for those out in the field. It's not the other way around. But very often, the managerial type think, I'm in the cushy job in the office, and you guys out in the field exists for me. The same thing can be said in the church. In some dioceses, I would say many dioceses around the world, the mentality is that the parishes exist for the chancery. Well, this is never admitted in practice, right? But in, in theory, rather. But in practice, that's the feeling on the ground. Whereas, in fact, the chancery exists for the good of the parishes, to help them flourish. And anything that doesn't do that is actually failing the role as, a, as leadership. So, so question time. Oh, sorry, a chancery is where is the basically the bishop's office in a particular diocese. So all the administrative arm of the diocese. I mean, you'll have the an educational wing, maybe you'll have a uh, financial wing, but then the, the chancery itself is you've got you know people, the secretarial staff, the the whatever, like maybe a vicar general there. You'll have a a um, any other staff. Uh, lay or cleric that are part of that uh, body. So I'm going to leave it there. We'll get to point lesson four next week. We might be able to move a bit fast next week, but I had to throw these extra explanations in because they're all uh, apropos the uh, the points we're doing. So any questions before we wrap up for today? Yeah. With lesson one. Yes. Um, I think today's slide would probably call it a bit shared richer and. Um, white privilege is the main. What's the difference, do you think, between that and rewarding people who do the work? Well, the essence of lesson one is actually that the good leader uh, almost always means at some point you're going to upset people. So not being, so it's actually about courage to act according to your convictions. One of those things is that those who work more should be rewarded more uh, in proportion to their work. Those who refuse to work shouldn't be rewarded. I mean, even St. Paul says this, inspired by the Holy Spirit in one of his letters, he said, if anyone doesn't eat, don't let him, uh, don't let him have anything. If everyone doesn't work, don't let him have anything to eat. So, uh, and, and laziness, now laziness and real poverty should not be confused. There are some who are in the unfortunate position of real poverty, and they need to be, they need a helping hand. But the real poverty often, with some of these people at least, is that they are, there's a lack of willingness to work. There is a real laziness, and they think the state owes them a life. Now, that kind of mentality is dangerous because it's actually, that's actually a, uh, a problem because then it means someone else is going to carry me. Whereas each person's labor, their ability to work, can not only earn enough for themselves, but also make a contribution for others' dependents and even for, for the common good.